Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the one, the only, the very last of the season, Five Things. That's right. We're on our finale episode. And today we have a very, very, very special guest for, t for you. You. Only you today. Um, but, of course, uh, first to introduce the show, uh, welcome to our show, Five Things, uh, the show where I ask brilliant, funny people uh, five things about whatever the hell I want, because for some reason, they put me in charge. I'm your host, Kaya Green. So, here at Five Things, we like to stay on theme, so before I introduce our amazing, talented, legendary guest, one Mr. Ken Hall, we are going to first do the warm-up five. Boom, 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 mouth air horns. Great. So, and real air horns, courtesy of Sean Murray, our tech, in the booth in his house today. Uh, so, number one of the warm up five. So, this show appears in both video and podcast form. Oh, the options. Uh, where there are visuals, I will do my best to describe them to you so you can picture them in your brain parts. So, for instance, right now you are looking at my face, and I am a small, androgynous person with short hair and round glasses. Sort of like, uh, I want you to picture like a Christmas elf if they were trying to blend in with normal humans and not succeeding. Number two. In this week's news, Umbrella Academy star Elliot Page has come out as transgender, which is awesome. Their pronouns are he, they, and uh, this is in fact, um, did I mention it before? Awesome. Big fan? Talk to me about it if you want to after the show. Um, number three, fun fact of the week. Did you know that over the course of your entire life, you will spend, this is true, approximately 38 days brushing your teeth? Oral hygiene is important. Number four, this is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat. We should learn their stories. They were here before us. This is their land, and we should respect it. Yeah. So, number five, last but most certainly not least, our guest today is Ken Hall. I am so very excited because I am a huge, huge fan of this individual. Hello, Ken. How are you doing? Hey, Kaya. How are you? Nice to oh, see you. I'm very, very, very good. How's your day? My day has been pretty good. Um, what did I do? I got to sleep in today a little bit, which is so lovely. I am always a fan of getting more sleep. Oh, yeah. Uh, my cat, I have a cat. His name is Gizmo. Um, Gizmo. A couple nights ago. Yeah, he's lovely. He's kind of like, he looks like a gremlin. So and Yeah, I was going to ask. Very, <laughs> he's big and fluffy. <laughs> Uh, I don't feed him after midnight, uh, and I try not to, to get him wet. Cats generally don't like to get wet. It's true. That's a good rule for all cats. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. is, actually. And he, uh, but a couple of nights ago, he woke me up in the middle of the night. I think it was about, like, 5 in the morning, uh, hearing this, like, like, this really, like, oh, no, my cat's in danger kind of thing. And all it is is that he's got this little this little fluff ball type of thing of that was attached to the cat condo that, that I bought him a while ago and he like he bit it off and now it's like there's a little bit of stuffing that's coming out from the top there and uh so that's his toy that he's like it's five in the morning I have to play now and please play with me and I'm like I no no I can't I cannot do this I cannot do this but he's very adorable it's an anomaly he usually lets me sleep but uh, that does happen from time to time. And uh, so last night, I actually, don't tell him, but I hit it on top of my refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> I will not tell him, but I can't guarantee that he won't watch this show. Yeah, so... he's in the other room right now. So if oh, no. keep it between us, that would be, <laughs> that would be ideal. <laughs> That's always tricky, too, because if you if you get up in the middle of the night and then you, you submit and you like play with them, then they'll just expect that to happen forever. Yeah. It's my fault. I, exactly. Yeah. I, and I've done that. And yeah. uh, so I've, I've learned my lessons, you know, life is full of lessons. And, and <laughs> so that's one of them. Uh, <laughs> but generally, he's amazing. Like 98% of the time, he is, he's totally fine. He, uh, he's very quiet. And he, you know, once I start stirring in the morning, then he'll come over, start licking my face and stuff. So, Cute. Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't, I don't feel good hiding his toys <laughs> at night. I feel like I'm a bad parent <laughs> in a way, but I need sleep. So at the end of the day, that's yeah. uh, that's the thing, right? 
Yeah, family's all about compromises, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Although the holidays are going to be kind of awkward if I, ooh, I got to make sure he, he's reunited with that because that could be quite uncomfortable. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because, you know, part of the family. <laughs> part of the family, exactly, totally. Very much um, well, I could talk about cats all day because I have sure. two of them and also a big fan, but I do have other questions. So how, how do you feel about jumping into this, uh, yes. into our five things? Absolutely. Let's, uh, let's jump in. Oh, I love it. Uh, all right. Um, thing number one. All right. Okay. So, so Ken, you, uh, fun fact for those of you who don't know, you are a comedian. You have done all That's sorts of fact. comedy. Uh, I, in fact, I read on the internet uh, that you have not only won a uh, Canadian Comedy Award, but you've also been nominated like seven times. Um, <laughs> yeah. You have a good long history in uh, comedy, but I'm always curious about like what got people into this weird, weird world that we live in. What what got you into comedy? Yeah, I, great question. Uh, my my origin story. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> is this yeah. <laughs> Uh, fighting crime uh, during the day. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Uh, I'll describe. I'll, I'll start off by describing myself too, uh, as you did as well. I, I am. Uh, my name is Ken Hall. I I've got some facial hair. I sort of look like a bit kind of like a pudgy Viking <laughs> right now. I've got short hair. I'm a small person as well. I'm four seven and three quarters. I'm wearing kind of like a blue purpley kind of button down shirt uh, as well, and I've got some uh, funky Apple iPhone uh, or earphones that I'm rocking right now. Um, <laughs> So that's me. Uh, and more of me, um, I got into doing comedy later in my life. Um, I got into doing comedy when I was about 30. That's when I, when I first took my, uh, my first improv, or actually my first drama class was probably around that time. Oh, we're going to my website. This is exciting. <laughs> uh, oh, this is, oh my gosh, that's so, I really need to update that photo. Uh, that's me. That's Jeff. Jeff the Gray. Oh, um, fun. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I played... Uh, in my 20s, uh, in my teens and 20s, I really did nothing. <laughs> I graduated. I went into the social service worker program in my early 20s, and uh, it took me three years to do a two-year college program. Never a good student uh, <laughs> at all. And, uh, you know, it's funny, though, because even though in a classroom, I wasn't necessarily skilled at, at, at the academic side of things. Uh, all of my friends were kind of outsiders and uh, and um, uh, underdogs in a lot of way, and so you know I naturally gravitated to to um, uh, having an education outside of a classroom, I guess you could say. Right. And uh, in my twenties, I played in a punk band, didn't really work at all, so I didn't really acquire any transferable skills that could help <laughs> me. And in my late twenties, I made a big decision. I made a decision to quit drinking. And uh, so I was 28 and I was like, I got to I got to stop this. This is really like the writing was very much on the wall. And uh, that was the thing, really, if I can trace it back to like, OK, uh, I wouldn't be here otherwise if I hadn't made that that choice back when I was 28. And that was a really hard thing because I was very much a pioneer in those days. I didn't really know anyone who had quit drinking. So it was a real kind of like it was a rough period of, of adjustment and so much of my life had been uh, revolved in that scene and much of my identity and how I saw myself and how I saw the world was kind of wrapped up in that so this is really no the kidding. first time of like unplugging yourself and really figuring out who I was and who I wanted to be and so that that started me on a bit of a process of of trying things of like the self-discovery so ended up volunteering at a youth shelter in Scarborough uh, for a year and realized that that's still too front line for me. It's kind of like it's, I was felt like on edge there and I like the idea of helping people and such, but it didn't feel like it was such a great fit. Um, ended up working at HMV, the big music store, Young and Dumbass mm -hmm. here uh, in Toronto. It's no longer there. Uh, yeah. Classic weird. history. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, it's funny actually, this idea of history, all these landmarks that I grew up with that seemed so permanent are no longer there. The very program that I went, I decided to go back to school in my late 20s, 30s. So I was taking the career and work counselor program at George Brown to become an employment counselor. And that program no longer exists anymore. The two places <laughs> that I worked at, one agency is completely gone. And the other place where I spend so much of my time has is now condos. So it's like all of these, again, these landmarks, I'm like, wow. And at that time, I'm kind of jumping all over the place. Um, but it, that's something that, that I, I find is really interesting. These like these landmarks, these these things that had so much meaning at the time and, and, and have like such great importance are no longer there. And I'm yeah. like, wow, that's, there's something within that. So uh, long, story, long story short, I ended up going back um, 
uh, to school for career counseling. And within that same time, I, uh, I was writing letters to my family in Britain. They actually came over here for the first time from uh, the north of England and Scotland and stuff. And huh. I got to reconnect with them. So I was just writing letters and they loved my letters. They're like, my aunt was so great. She's like, your, your letters are so funny. And I've never, my family's Scottish. So we're not used to like hearing praise. <laughs> like, what, what is that? What is this you're trying to do? Is this a uh, trick of some kind? <laughs> it doesn't to... compute. I <laughs> A feeling. What is that? Uh, my, my family's great. But again, it's just like, you know, that's a cultural thing. It's a generational thing as well. But my aunt was like very encouraging. And, and they really, that side of my family really loved uh, the letters and they thought they were really funny and such. So that, that gave me a bit of a boost. And I started doing creative writing night school classes here uh, through the Toronto District School Board. And I signed up for, I did that for a couple of years. I'm like, I want to do something else. So it was about when I was 30 that I signed up for a uh, beginner drama class through the through, at Central Tech, which is uh, a school here in Toronto, and I didn't tell anyone. I, I didn't even tell my family. I didn't tell my brother. I didn't tell my best friend because I felt so fragile. I felt like it was such a, a thing that if anyone had said any comments or like, oh, you know, made fun of it in some way, I felt like it would have affected me in a great thing. And this for me was like, this is something so important, and this is for me, and this is a good thing, and. Um, I remember telling my best friend at a, a bar in, in Parkdale. I wasn't drinking. We were just having dinner there. And I'm like, yeah, man, I, I got to tell you something. I uh, For the last seven weeks or so, I've been doing an acting class. And he's like, great, right, man. You should be doing that years ago. <laughs> so, it, But again, it's like our, all our mindset and our self-talk and such. But I wanted yeah. to incubate it. I, want, I felt like I needed to protect it. I needed to kind of keep it safe because it was play. It was pure play. And for so much of my life, up until that moment, I had not felt playful. I hadn't felt creative. I hadn't felt connected with people. And so this is kind of, for me, I look at it as almost like defrosting myself and like reintegrating back into society in a way yeah. and, and really connecting with who I think I always have been. But I got, de you know, I got detoured early on in my life and, I, and, and my life kind of went one way, but I'm so happy and so grateful to be where I'm at. So I started doing improv classes when I was 30. Went to Second City, level A, never stopped. I just kept on doing it. And <laughs> it's one of those things. You're an improv person too. Like we just know the transformative. It is such a healing thing and so fun. And I loved comedy. I always loved comedy growing up. But I grew up in Etobicoke, a suburb of Toronto. And you never make that connection of like, all right, comedy world, look out. Because <laughs> there's nothing there. Like, yeah. Um, and it wasn't on my radar. It didn't seem even something to entertain. And uh, so, again, I'm so grateful I found it later in life. And But that's the thing. And I found improv and improv was quitting drinking and finding improv were the very things that just changed everything, a complete 180. And the rules of improvisation, the idea of being open to others and collaboration and creativity and spontaneity and, and a sense of like owning who you are, bringing you to the, to the table, so to speak. And you, you are good. You know what I mean? Like, because yeah. I've had this messaging that I'm, I'm like, oh, not worthwhile. And that's been reinforced tremendously over my life. But so finding something that I'm like, this feels really good. And the people are wonderful. This whole idea of non-judgmental, you know, and collaboration. And, you know, we're building something together. And so that idea of yes ending, I started to yes end in my scenes. And I started yes ending in my life. And there was a, and that changed me. That was it. It was a complete 180. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I've been doing life all wrong. Uh, I've been saying no to everything in my life when in actuality you say yes to things. You give yourself experiences, albeit that can be scary. And yeah. there's a vulnerability within that of taking risks and putting yourself out there and and feeling rejection and such. And I love that feeling of getting up there and, and bombing. It doesn't feel good. <laughs> it's a terrible feeling. But there's always the next scene. And, you know, I've, over the years, I've got like a higher kind of batting average, you know, and, yeah. and now I've been doing it for 16 years now and 16 plus years probably. And, and it's just, uh, it's, it's assisted me uh, in tremendous, like it's built a career for me, but it's also, uh, it's just helped me come to, you know, come uh, almost like finding peace within myself, finding well-being and, and happiness genuine happiness and and the lovely thing is again i'm like i'm not trying to be someone i'm just being me and uh, I, I quite like that letting go of these old labels that i carried with me it was such a burden and it would just siphon so much energy away from me but to really show up and to 
bring people joy by making people laugh is like it's such a lovely thing it's such a healing thing for an audience and it's a healing thing for me as well so it's a very reciprocal exchange uh i like to feel and i'm always mindful of where i've come from and you know looking back where i'm like hey, it didn't have to be here it, things could have turned out <laughs> very very uh differently so um that's the kind of thing that i'm like i i just it feels good to be where I'm at and uh, and it just comes from just saying yes to putting yourself in situations where you have experiences and you just you know think about like how does that match up with who you want to be and yeah uh, so so that's how I got into doing that's how I got into doing comedy wow you know I've heard a lot of people uh, sort of uh, non-improvisers ask what it is about improv that gets people so excited about it and I think that might have been like that answer might have been the just the perfect distillation of exactly what it is that gets people so excited about it I will drop my mic but I don't want to break it cause yeah yeah it's, it's a, road mic. It's, <laughs> it's a <laughs> nice <thank> one <laughs> but you dropped it in spirit and that's what matters. <laughs> metaphorically I dropped yeah, it. yeah exactly well thank you I appreciate it um, well, uh, on that note like moving on to thing number two I, I've, okay. I've had the uh, I've had the pleasure of getting to watch you perform uh, in various different circumstances, including your troupe Two Man No Show um, mm -hmm. with Isaac Kessler. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, recently, as I was sort of like doing a little, doing a little research for this show, um, I learned that you had been in a punk band before and that you were a big yeah. punk fan when you were younger. And for me, uh, knowing the way you perform with Isaac, that kind mm -hmm. of clicked in a way of like oh i can kind of see that um so i'm curious because like you have a very unique style of improv specifically when you're uh when you're performing with isaac but also just in general um mm -hmm. do you feel like that contributed to it is there like a design behind that uh, there's no design <laughs> there really there should be there probably should be uh when i play with isaac it is like that you know i found someone that uh, i think is one of the funniest people I've ever met and Isaac me and Isaac are so uh, willing to go to places where perhaps other people are, are, are not willing and part of it was early on in, in Two Man No Show we've been together as a duo for 11 and a half years now 2009 was our first uh, was wow. our first show as part of Toronto Frames so you know they, they, we have a, a really great friendship he's my best friend but it's like we when we take that onto a stage it's just play because Isaac has also experienced some hardships in his life. And, and, and But when we come together, we want to just embrace play and pursue play at all costs. And, yeah. um, uh, you know, it's funny that you mentioned the whole punk thing as well. For me, I, I, there's within comedy, there, it's all about commitment and and really selling things. And, and this is a very clannish thing, too, where we have nothing. And our first show, to the initial show, like uh, back in 2009, we literally didn't have a show a month out before we open we, that's why we call ourselves two man no show because we don't have a show we let, and that's not a good place to be four weeks out and you're like we have nothing this is not good so stressed out it doesn't, but then we said we got a, a we got a skeleton of a show and so that was a bit of our, our you know we're architecting a bit of a framework to play in and I, I often say this story my mom was watching my parents would come to the show i think they came to four out of the eight shows that we did and my mom was like, oh, it's such a dangerous show uh, because the dialogue would change because we weren't strong writers. If a joke doesn't land, <laughs> we're like, well, that sucks. Let's try another one. <laughs> Let's try and make you laugh. So there's an inherent like, I'm coming at you. I'm going to give you something. We're going to play and we're going to play hard, but we're going to have a ton of fun. And, but you're here. You're sitting in the space. We, it's not we have that fourth wall. We shatter that fourth wall. We've always done yep. that partially because our jokes weren't good so we're like well <laughs> we just called it out we're like oh that didn't work let's try another one <laughs> you know um but that commitment because like i think of like people that have really inspired me i think of like the intensity of like someone like joe strummer for example the the singer of the clash who was just yeah. like just incredibly like 100 you give it 110 percent and uh I, you know it's it's i i've only thought of this recently actually but i can see actually how that has been influencing my play <laughs> and who would have thought that something so completely what would seem polar opposite of of you know speaking the truth to power and really confronting things and and uh a sort of a, a nihilistic kind of like in your face but we can bring that into into our, our performance and that's and, and i'm also both me and isaac are very heavily influenced within clown which is like they're you know let's break rules let's mess with conventions and such and we often play from that place where we don't focus on a story we focus on play 
and we will do what what is needed. It's a very subversive way, in a sense, because there's no improv theater <laughs> that would ever teach that our style yeah. <laughs> because it's too like it's like what are you doing like there's a story so um but we've left venues many times during our shows like to like go around the green room the back you know the parking lot to come through the front for no inherent reason necessarily i mean but to do it it just feels like that's the thing to do in the moment and the yeah. audience is like kind of like what what is going on here they remember our shows uh, and, and but we're kind of polarizing some people. I mean, we played the Edinburgh Fringe Festival back in 2010. There was one show that we did where the entire front row got up and <laughs> a quarter of a quarter of the way through our show and walked down and not like Canadian polite politeness of like, oh, no, like, shh, you know, <laughs> they're like, come on, <laughs> you know, like for vanity and there's like, there's like no filter. And I'm like, oh, oh no. Gosh. Yeah, but it's all good. We uh, so uh, you know again we we might not. I mean, th that was could be for other things too because it's like uh, people like to drink at the Edinburgh Fringe and they want to party. There's that too. Like, what yeah. is this show that we're watching? So they're already pretty drunk. And our show was a late show. It was eleven forty-five every night. Um, but th that's the thing of like you know I like messing with conventions. And Mark Andrada was our director for the first and third show that we did. And Mark is a clown, and Mark is very much of, like, his shows that he's done of, like, I think he's done a fringe show where he had his audience, and he got his audience to get up, to leave the venue with him, to then finish his show in someone else's show on their stage. Like, and I'm like, oh, that's that's the director for us. That's the kind of, <laughs> like, outlandishness that yep. uh, I'm sure they had planned. I'm sure it was organized. He's not just, like, going into you know, <laughs> excuse me, TJ Da and like, you know, going into a place. But I, I love this idea. It's a, there's a freedom within that and, and doing that and playing with Isaac and giving myself permission to not follow the rules or to try and fit in because I don't fit in. As I said, I'm four, seven and three quarters. I have major scoliosis. I didn't mention that, but I have major scoliosis. So I stand out. I've always stood out. I've never fit in in a traditional sense of that word, but performing really was that thing where there is a there is a place for me now in the world and and not just in an improv community but in the comedy community as well as now film and tv and uh, again i'm very um i'm very grateful for that I'm getting yeah emotional just talking about that that's, <laughs> that's fair it's, i mean it's fucking inspiring <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've always loved watching that, uh, watching you two on stage, and I've had the pleasure of teching you guys a number of times because I, there's just no predictability to it. And there have been times where I think I had to take you out immediately after you got a suggestion because you were, <laughs> you were bantering with the audience for the entire length of your set. <laughs> and that made oh, me man. so happy. I can't possibly describe it. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Yeah, it's a lovely um, thing, and, and that's the thing, I'm like, I love teaching, I love helping people, I love, like, giving people that invitation to do your thing, to find and discover your thing, you know, and, and there really is, you know, you pave your own way in a lot of, in, in a lot of sense, and I, I just think it pays dividends when you can own who you are, and you find other people, and you find an audience, you find your audience, there, I think there is a place within that, it, it, it might feel scary, and it might feel, you know, really vulnerable, but at the end of the day, I mean, that's your moneymaker, you know, you be yeah. you, without having to try to do anything, it's just like, there's a, I'm in a place in my life where I'm like, I'm really trying to pursue acceptance. And uh, the more I, I feel like I accept myself, the more I just let go of inhibitions. <laughs> so I'm very like, uh, I'm very hungry to perform and, and to see how uh, when we do get back to like doing live shows of like, of, I don't know, it'll be interesting to see because our audiences will be, will have changed along yeah. with us as well. Like there's going to be, like there already has been an evolutionary you know, experience over the last several months. So yeah, yeah, it's, it'll be exciting. On the subject of clown, that was, mm -hmm. brings me to thing number three, which I wanted to ask about your clown bra background. Cause I know there's many different kinds of clown. And I, uh, I did read that you've had some time working with Cirque du Soleil, which is pretty huge. Um, yeah. do you want to talk about that a little? Yeah, sure. I, I got into clown again like that. That really comes so much of my performance experience really is derived from two man, no show and, and playing with Isaac. And uh, right from the get-go, that was something that people had commented on within our show because we broke that fourth wall. I think the size of us as well, four, seven, three quarters, Isaac being bigger. Uh, so right from the get-go, people were like, oh, we love the vaudevillian aspect. And, and even in that first show, I did, a, I did a sketch where I fall in love with a chair. 
and I court a chair, and it's to Sir Brightman's Love Changes Everything, and it's a, it's a clown piece. I didn't know it was really a clown piece until our director, Mark Andrada, who's also a clown, he's like, this is a clown piece. I'm like, oh, okay, well, I don't know. I just It derived from an improv exercise I did in the workshop with David Rizowski, many years ago and it was it, but it felt so real it's so I, like I, so i go through the relationship of courting a chair we fall in love we start dating and then i propose and then we get married <laughs> then we go to the honeymoon where alex with a chair <laughs> of course and, naturally uh, but naturally the natural progression and i mean it's it. nice that you waited till marriage well i felt so i mean <laughs> okay. my chairs are very traditional point. My parents wouldn't have, have approved otherwise. So. <laughs> uh, so the clown thing was always in the DNA. It's kind of baked into the work that we do. We just didn't know we were doing it. And so over the years, because it's been something that we've gravitated to, it really is more of our style, um, we started seeking out uh, opportunities to train. And Isaac, he's always been a pioneer within this. He's always had an ear to the ground, so to speak, of like, of... He was the one who got con who connected me with long form improvisation, which I was like, oh my god, what is this this beautiful art form, this whole matrix world that we can play in? And he did a uh, Philippe Gaulier, who's one of the, he's kind of like, um, kind of like the Del Close of clown. So he's this old clown from France who has his own school and such. He came here to Toronto and he taught a Buffon workshop, which is the idea of like the pleasure to be nasty, sort of an offshoot of clown. Um, and uh, and he came back the and Isaac just raved about it. Then he came back the following year to teach play, and to teach Red Nose Clown. And so that was my, I think that was really my first experience within that. And it was hard. It was real tough. You yeah. Know, Philippe Gaulier does not laugh. He burns you. That's his style. He just burns and insults you. But I, I there was something there. There was it was kind of like a pure improv for me because I don't have a scene partner. I'm just going out there on my own. And 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 I think in terms of like evolving as a person, it just also felt like such an expedited way to perform because you're sing you in order to do clown you're opening yourself up to fail tremendously and yeah. to and to if you are honest with your failure you know I'm like oh that was terrible I do something I propose something no one laughs and I'm genuinely like feeling rough that I did not make you laugh and if I can speak to the fact that honestly of like that sucked. Oh boy. I, you know, I'm never going to do that again. I promise I will never do the audience is like, yeah, that was terrible. And then they laugh and it sort of breaks that tension. Then they're back on your side. Yeah. And there's a, there's a great honesty because usually when we're on a stage, we don't like to fail. We hide our failure. You yeah. Know, we, we, I love that analogy. Like someone's like, you know, walking down the street and then you trip and then you sort of break into this jog as if you're supposed to have done that. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's a, <laughs> it's that same kind of idea. So if you can admit your, I mean, and it's just like, there's such a wonderful feeling of exposing yourself on a stage. I don't mean like taking your clothes off. I just mean like, this is me. You see me for who I am. And I'm being honest. I'm truthful in that moment. There's a higher probability that even if the audience doesn't even laugh, they'll think you're beautiful. And there's something, again, you do not have to be anyone. You just, you show up. So the clown for me was like, that was an opportunity that I got to train with Philippe Ollier. And that was a real eye opener. And then I just started training all over. Um, Paula Coletto from, uh, from Italy, she moved to Chicago, then LA, and then back to Italy. But she's a, a Jacques Lecoq, you know, uh, a teacher in, in uh, something like only like 40 that are trained to teach in the Jacques Lecoq like style and such. So it's, and then I trained with one of my favorite clown teachers is Francine Cote in Montreal. And that was interesting because Goliath is just like, no, that's not it. Goodbye. We do not like, can, no. You, uh, uh, but Francine Cote was all about technique. And so what is your body proposing and, and, and such? And I was like, oh, the two kind of come together. So it's like, there's a stage, there's an audience. Get up there and do whatever you can to make them laugh. But with Francine's training, it was like, oh, now I actually know. I, I can, as an actor, I'm sort of like looking outside of myself and I can see what I'm proposing. I have control over it then. So I have control huh. of my gestures and I'm like, oh my gosh. So it's really like you're in like this master control room, like with all these dials and levers and stuff. But there's a sense of like, oh, I know why you just laughed. Great. And I'm going to redo that to, 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 to play in this moment. And so much a clown is just playing moments. And that has transformed into the improv that I do with Isaac. So, you know, we've gotten this tag of it a clown prop. But that's what I'm saying. We're looking to play moments. We're not looking to follow a story. There is a story, you know, uh, but it, it's, uh, there is a structure. <laughs> but we're looking at, let's play this moment. Oh, you laughed? Great. 
we're not moving on. We're going to stay here. We're going to like build up sh a shop, pitch our tents. We're not going anywhere because you like this. So, uh, you know, it's so that's the kind of thing. Clown was just a very freeing thing, both as, uh, in terms of like a performance tool, but it was really like as a person to step in there and to embrace failure, but to also embrace honesty of who you are. And there's a beautiful authenticity that comes with that. But it's hard because... And I know for myself, like, there's a lot of self-consciousness. There's a lot of shyness. There's a lot of old tapes still running within me of, like, are you going to like me? Are you, you know, and, and feeling a hesitation by putting myself out there. But I got to say, the more times I do it, I'm, you're just rewarded by it. And, there, and, and it feels really good to have an audience. And it's, it's effortless. When you find something that works, it's like you're on easy street. In a way, because it's a, you're designing a conversation, or you're 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 creating a conversation with the audience in tandem with the audience, and I uh, and it, it's effortless in in the sense that that's all they're asking you to do. Just keep doing what you're doing, and so it's not about necessarily being clever. It's not about wordplay or verbal stuff. If if anything, I mean, I've spent a lot of I've gotten a lot of success on stage from being uh, for doing ridiculous things. And like, for, like that's, that's not smart. You know, I can get, like, I'll have a lot of play and just like sitting down. I can, I'll, I'll, you know, like, I'll, like, I won't get comfy or something. And then, and if the audience responds, I'm like, great, then that's what I'm going to do for as long as I can do it. And, uh, and so, and I'm, but I'm building it with their permission. I'm including them in the design of it. It's not just me coming down and being like, you're going to think this chair thing's funny. <laughs> and that's painful, right? When someone's driving yeah. their own agenda and they don't clock in that the audience is not on board, you perhaps missed a few steps along the way. And so, uh, again, I think it's like it's such a, a, a great thing that you can build a conversation. And the audiences, um, they don't they don't actually need a lot. They don't need a lot of story. They don't need a lot of um, uh, they don't need to work for the laugh. You know, I think hmm. Mr. Bean, for example, yeah. you know, it's such a simple thing worldwide. You know, it, it, it surpasses a language. People understand more of what the body is proposing in the situations around that. I It's funny, early in the pandemic, I, I, I was like, <laughs> I started watching a lot of like war documentaries, maybe to get my head off like what was going on. And I started watching Tiger King and that was just depressing, but it was really interesting. <laughs> And, and I like I, that uh, you consider Tiger King more depressing than the World War documentaries. <laughs> and I, I honestly don't think you're wrong. <laughs> it was, I, oh my God, that show, that's a whole other kind of episode. It's, but it's like, a lot. Need, yeah, but I was like, I need something light. So I started watching Mr. Bean. Again, I hadn't seen a Mr. Bean episode in years. But it was like the one where he's like, he's writing an exam. And all it is, oh. just, he doesn't, he, he, he doesn't. He doesn't take the right exam out of the folder, but he spends all of his time trying to cheat off the guy beside him. And I'm like, it's so brilliant. Like, it's so simple. And he's got all these pens. And stuff. like, it's just, I love that. I love the simplicity of that. And uh, so for me, clown is just, it's a, there's a freedom within that. There's a scary freedom, but there's an exhilaration that goes and you survive it. And, there, you know, that's the kind of thing that I think more people could really benefit from is to give themselves the opportunity to fail publicly. <laughs> to fail in front yep. of others so that you can you can survive it yeah it's, it's it's really the audience is um less on your side when you do not acknowledge your failure but if you acknowledge your failure in front of other people people are like hey we see you as being a human being and that's kind of funny you know and we all mess up as well yeah i mean i i hear this sometimes and i'm sure you hear it so much as an improv and clown teacher of people saying like oh i couldn't do that and yeah. every time I hear someone say it, I'm like, I promise you, that's exactly why you could do it. Because everybody feels that way, even the people that do it every day. Yeah. And the funny thing is, you've already done it. Everyone, <laughs> everyone's grown up. Everyone has. Being a kid, generally, uh, you play pretend when you're a kid, you know? And, and yeah. but adults, I think they lose that. They lose that sense of playfulness and possibility. And uh, it's so lovely to watch adults. I love teaching beginner adults because it's like yeah. you're, you're reconnecting them with a younger part of themselves and they're you know they're kind of like they're looking to do it right and and uh but you see them starting to open up and starting to gain reconnect and 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 have conversations with their self-talk because it's you're right they're the ones it's not me <laughs> i'm not going down the street not you not me. <laughs> <laughs> maybe <laughs> it's them they're only there we create our own obstacles we're the ones who say no i can't do that you can just, 
you can do it. You're the only one to say no. They can't yeah. do it. And I just think there's there's such a freedom and a joy within play and how cathartic play is. And it's like nowadays, we need play more than ever. You oh, know? yeah. And I noticed this actually early on. I teach a lot. Uh, I Before the pandemic, taught a lot in person, uh, public speaking, clown, improv, all that kind of stuff. And then like going online, I'm like, oh, boy, how's this going to work? Is this even going to work? But I remember early on, I was teaching even a public speaking class. I'm like, we're just going to do a basic warm up the exercise. And we laughed so hard because I just think people were like needing a release, needing, you know, a sense of like, let, you know, let's uh, let's just play and enjoy. So, yeah, we need play. We need play. Awesome. Wow. Oh, <laughs> I'm just. I have a million things I want to ask you. I, I can't, unfortunately, because we will eventually run out of time. Right, um, so right. we're going to move on to thing number four. Uh, okay. We're just going to bring it to a completely different level right now. Get get really, really, really deep. Right. I read again uh, in my cursory research that your favorite me meal is cereal. Would you? Is this correct? Wow. Your research team is excellent. They have done <laughs> quite, a, quite a bang up job. Good. I... I don't pay them enough, honestly. <laughs> 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 Raises for everyone. <laughs> uh, it's actually, I, I, uh, hmm, I actually have a new favorite meal. Um, Gasp. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I'm yeah. firing my whole team. <laughs> Drop the mic. No, 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 I still, I still love cereal. I still love cereal. But I, I've stopped. Well, one of the reasons, because I'm like, I can't have cereal for like a midnight snack. There's way too much sugar mm -hmm. in it. And But it's one of the things, too. I'm like, oh, I can hardly wait till I wake up in the morning. I can have some <laughs> my Just Right. You know, yeah. my Kellogg's Just Right. It's a classic. It's a classic brand. Here's can't go thing. wrong. Uh, I discovered a place. It was actually uh, a couple years uh, a couple years ago. Um uh, I was doing it. Yeah, I was actually I was doing a fringe show. I was doing uh, Moonstruck at the Tarragon, and in the green room there was like this someone, whoever they are. I really want to thank them for like connecting me to this because it's it's been a life changer. Uh, uh, there was a, a flyer for this restaurant called Indian uh, Roti Cuisine of India. Oh, I love that had, place. Oh yeah, it's my that's, favorite meal. It's yes, so that's good. my go-to roti place. <laughs> Have you tried their pakoras? I have, and they're incredible. Drop the mic. Drop the mic. So good. Amazing. So good. Butter chicken roti, chicken curry roti. Like, you cannot go wrong. I no. recently just got my parents on to them now, and my parents are so great. <laughs> like, once a week, they'll like, you know, I just got to say thanks again for, uh, you know, we had that the other night, and it is like, it's such a great meal. So I, I'm glad that it, you have this. Oh. in your life but that's my that's my favorite meal now it really is have a nice little side salad watch the mandalorian it is like uh, it, i'm in a happy place there's, oh. there's a real <laughs> there's a real joy you're describing a perfect night right there that's that's a very good time <laughs> exactly exactly i have if do, do you have like a go to go to roadie there well see i, I kind of change it up it really like i go on my gut and <laughs> literally and uh Lately, I've been doing this kind of jamming thing. It was getting first time when I first discovered I was like going there about three times a week, which is probably too many times. So I've scaled back to probably on average, I'll say about two. So on my Fridays, I'll usually <laughs> this is what it's been as of late Fridays, butter chicken roti, and then uh, Saturday, I'll change it up. I'm gonna go with a chicken curry roti, and that's it. I'm, I'm good, I'm good for the next week. Then you know, it gets me, it gets me through so good consistently. The, the sauce. There's some other places that just like go way too much, too overboard on the sauce. They drown the roti, and, and it's a shame. It's a tragedy. The sauce is such a key component of that, but they got the ratio right, and it just feels so, uh, dare I say, love. <laughs> like it's made with love. Like it's like a warm yes, hug. You know? <laughs> absolutely. Go support that restaurant, everybody. Go go get a roti there. They're incredible, <laughs> and they absolutely need to live through this pandemic, or I will cry. Oh, yeah. Don't no, make me not cry. Hurting. Well, here's the thing. They're not hurting. They, they, you That's know, good. I, I can appreciate other businesses. or I don't think that they are, are feeling the effects of it in that same way. There's always like a steady stream of people. Which is great. Go support all of the small businesses. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so uh, we're going to move on to number five, thing number five. <laughs> Um, okay, which is, uh, you have been working on a little show that some people might have heard of called the Umbrella Academy. 
Um, just a, just a little yeah, show it's that a tiny is tiny little tiny big show, tiny massive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> tiny massive, hugely hugely popular show. <laughs> um, so it, correct me if I'm wrong. You were originally playing the motion capture for for Pogo, um, yeah. uh, which. Uh, must have been so interesting to be working in motion capture. Um, yeah. But as the show has go- gone on, you've, uh, you're now playing Herb and sort of moving forward in the universe. How, what's that journey been like? Um, it has been incredible. It's been a remarkable journey. Um, I started doing it, as I said, Pogo and uh, the body of Pogo, basically from the shoulders down. Adam Godley from Breaking Bad, he is the, the face and the voice of Pogo. And for me, it was such a cool opportunity to do motion capture and to play such a, uh, a such a really cool character as Pogo as well. Uh, a very sort of paternal elderly chimpanzee, which is like, that's, I, I love it. And the, the fact that he's an animal, but he's like a gentle animal and he is, uh, you know, to physicalize both a chimpanzee and to physicalize an elderly chimpanzee. I love the challenge of that too. And... <clears throat> I really, and this is, a, a, I think, a really beautiful arc uh, of a story as well as that. I, I, I really try to bring a lot of preparation. So I show up to set ready to play. And I want to. I don't like being on set where I'm like, well, I could have done that better. It just doesn't feel good. I don't like, I don't like having that feeling in improv and I don't like having that feeling um, uh, on set. So I'm like, I, that's why I want to like go and show up. Like, how do you show up in life? I want to show up really prepped and ready to play. And uh, <clears throat> I think they saw that. And uh, even though it wasn't going to be my voice, uh, <laughs> which I quite like my poker voice, <laughs> in all honesty. Uh, and uh, but Adam is great. Adam is such a lovely guy, and and uh, he's great. He's totally the voice of Pogo, and absolutely should be. And uh, but I showed up, and I'm like, I'm 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 really going to give it. And I'm uh, you know kind of like we we're saying earlier, the old Joe Strummer. Um, and uh, I think they saw that, and about halfway through production, so about three months in, we're shooting for about six months in total, but three months in, <clears throat> my agent here in Toronto, uh, she reached out and she's like, oh, um, production wants to know if you want to play a person. It's a small role, but would you like to play a person? I'm like, absolutely, I would love to play a person. And so I, I got to play uh, in a scene, episode six of season one is where we introduce Herb. And uh, it's a very small, small bit, but there was a lot of comedy within her. Pogo, Pogo was not written in a comedic context, uh, but Herb certainly is. And the relationship that I had with the handler, played by Kate Walsh, who's very scary and high status and uh, a bit of a psychopath, <laughs> she, uh, it was great. And she, right from the get-go, like there was this already, like she's kind of burning me and I'm like f- in fear of her. <laughs> and uh, so that was a lovely dynamic to play off of. And I, I remember talking to the showrunner uh, he was like, that's laugh at, you were laugh at loud funny. And I'm like, yeah, great. I was so happy to hear that, that, that people really enjoyed what I did. <clears throat> and then fast forward to the start of season two, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I, uh, I got to the, uh, we had a, a read through, which often happens the first, um, uh, you know, the first see or the first episode back you bring everyone there and i had two auditions in the east end that day and i'm like okay i should be there in time i did not get there in time i was late and i was i got there a pa person was trying to help get me into the room we're going to do a massive read through where it's like everyone the whole cast all the producers directors like all the netflix people like every there's like 100 people in this room and so I'm late to it. I'm like, oh my gosh. And I go in, but I did. I never really like, cheered. It was such a lovely moment. I felt so appreciated. And and, um, and so I, 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 it was after that that the producers came up. And they're like, yeah, we've, we've got some ideas. we got some big things planned for Herb this season. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is fantastic. And sure enough, they did. And so it was lovely to see how Herb has evolved uh, over season two. They really did a, a fantastic job. And, and I feel really proud of the work that I did. I mean, it's more of my natural abilities as well and there's a lot of clown that goes into her a lot of play and a lot of like comedy that is that that i i'm quite comfortable in 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 playing uh as well and and i i really was very uh very humbled and and, and taken aback by the reaction that herb got when it got released this summer uh season two and people like really really appreciating the work that I did and and really loving Herb and Herb's antics and such. So uh, it's it's been remarkable to, to be on a show that I think is very ahead of the curve 
And I, I think in terms of like diversity and inclusion and things like that, and, and just really fantastic, like Peter Jackson's people, like Weta, like the, you know, like everything that goes in the special effects of that show, but it's the stories and it's the characters. And season two, you know, going deeper into really like, you know, flushing more of this amazing world that they get to play in. Uh, and it, I, I like it, and I also really find an affinity to it because it's weird. It's wonderfully weird, and and I'm used, that's the world that I live in. For, I've always been weird. I've never fit in, so it's amazing that Gerard yeah. Way wrote such a beautiful, you know, a uh, uh, graphic novel where it's it's it it's not, you know, I, I love this feeling that like again, it's breaking out, it's trying something unconventional, and and in terms of storytelling, and how can you do that? And and I, I again, I I thought they've done an amazing job, at the first two seasons of like just. You know, here's here you know, this massive. I remember reading the graphic novel uh, after I got Pogo, and I'm like, how are we gonna? And we're fighting the graphic novel. They're fighting the the Eiffel Tower is an alien, and so of course, right? of course, yeah. naturally. So I'm yeah. like, okay, that's yeah. probably a two day shoot. So you know, like, <laughs> but that's that's how like uh, grandiose. That's how kind of like again, like the, you know, uh, there's there there is a real freedom in, in like. Curb, who is like now the you know commission of like this whole like time traveling you know uh, looking after timelines and stuff like that it is just it's a it's such a fun world to play yeah. in and it has everything it's like it's not one particular genre it's like it's not set in one time and it's like again the stories is so wonderful it's really there's a there's a place for everyone in it which is pretty pretty excellent and just like oh i haven't uh had a chance to see season two yet and i am very very excited to do so <laughs> oh no that's okay i uh didn't catch any spoilers there and uh i Your just know that team. Your yes. research team made it a point like we're not gonna we can't <laughs> like <that enough. laughs> i've been meeting to i'm very very excited to watch it because i thoroughly enjoyed the first season uh do you have dreams for uh, a season three herb and what might what might happen <laughs> well uh, we just found out a few weeks ago that we got picked up for a third season. Yeah. Which is going to be starting to shoot here in Toronto in February. Um, <laughs> uh, what would I like to see of Herb? I I was thinking over the summer it would be nice to see Herb, like, on his day off. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I don't know. Just, uh, like, very domestic <laughs> Herb. Like, when, like, does he go fishing? You know, like, what does he do? Does he have an improv team or an improv troupe that he performs with? You know, like... <laughs> Uh, I don't know, and uh, it's well. That's the thing is like it can go anywhere, um, but I <laughs> or like Herb taking a pottery class or something, like, uh, <laughs> just yeah. exploring himself, you know, yeah, having exactly. a hobby. Or Herb's doing Herb, you know, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm just looking forward to you know seeing whatever happens and and it's such an and how I won't give any spoilers because I want you to see it and uh, but like how season two ends up, it's like possibilities there's just possibilities that are that are happening in this world so oh that's delightful yeah. well uh we we've come to the end of our time which is mm. you know i feel like we keep going forever but uh i feel like the, the just everything kind of sums up with the possibilities if you commit hard enough oh that's great i yeah i love that that is amazing <laughs> uh it. well Thank you so much for coming on and sharing so much for yourself today. Like, just so appreciate it. Um, if you have people, uh, or sorry, if people want to check you out on the internet, where would they find you? Can they follow you places? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, I'm more active on Instagram. So at the Ken Hall is, uh, is where you can find me. Amazing. And uh, Umbrella Academy is also on Netflix. Is that correct? That is, yeah, very much. Very yeah. Much on Netflix. Uh, so go watch that, people. Y'all. Yeah, go watch Umbrella Academy. Go watch Netflix. Ton of great stuff on Netflix yeah. as well. Uh, and catch me and Isaac, uh, some two man no show. See some clown prov. And, and uh, yeah, follow us there at two man no show, also on Instagram. There you go. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Ken. And thank you so much to uh, everybody who is out with the show over the course of this season. So thanks so much to our techs, uh, Connor Lowe and Sean Murray, uh, who have made this possible. Yeah, mouth air horns. Uh, <laughs> to uh, to Coco Glore and the Sonar Network and Bad Dog Theater. Um, you can subscribe and follow and 
donate to Bad Dog Theater at baddogtheater.com slash five things. There it is right in the bottom. Um, because all of this, all of these shows that come to you almost every night of the week here on Bad Dog TV are all run by donations. So if you love them, if you love people like Ken, and how could you not? I pointed the wrong direction. You're that way. There we go. Uh, <laughs> then, uh, then if you want to see more content like this, donate if you can, or tell your friends, your family, your dogs, your pets. Tell everyone you know. Um, and that way we can keep bringing you delightful nonsense. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you, Ken. I'm Kaya Green. Uh, and stay safe, friends. Bye.